Uh, so you mentioned that their offspring, uh, son of James, was Jim, uh, what the family called him, but he may have officially been named Shadrach. And you said you talk about the discrepancy. So where did that discrepancy come from? How did he have different names? Well, I think he was called Jim officially by by the family. But it was through later research that my cousins and I came across a free man of color whose name was Shadrach. And Shadrach is very interesting because he was Jim, the person that we call Jim, was born in Virginia in 1792. And Shadrach, according to the census, was born in Virginia in 1792. And the the name Shadrach is not all that common, but there was a Shadrach on at Montpelier who was an older man, but we believe that the the Jim Shadrach person, you know, was a namesake of the older Shadrach, and that's how that name happened to get chosen. And then later, after so Jim ended up being sold, kind of have, having to jump around a bit here. But Jim got sold and ended up in Tennessee, in Gibson County. And his son, well, actually, I'm, let me back up a little. Let me correct that. Jim ended up in Tennessee. His son, Emmanuel, at least one of his sons, whose name was Emmanuel, was in Gibson County, Tennessee. In the 1820s, he was the property of Jephthah Billingsley. Now, let's hold on to the name Billingsley. Shadrach was originally owned by Jephthah's father, whose name was Samuel. But Samuel freed him in Bledsoe County, Tennessee. And Shadrach remained there until 1828. At that time, he left Bledsoe and moved to Gibson County. And I believe and my cousins and I who have worked on some of this together believe that he made that move because he learned that Emmanuel was there. So if Emmanuel was his son, he would have wanted to be near him. Hmm. And it's, it's just interesting that they're owned by the same family. There's a, there's a relationship there. So as I said, Emmanuel was owned by Jephthah, and and Shadrach was owned by Samuel. And the, Shadrach also purchased land from his from Jephthah's mother Mary. So I'm I'm just saying that to say how close the two families were. So there was the African American family, and then there was the um, Caucasian family, the Billingsleys. So when when Shadrach learned that Emmanuel was with Jephthah in Gibson County, he left his he had another family in Bledsoe County, left them there, moved to Gibson County, purchased land from Mary Billingsley and started up a, a business there. He did later bring that family to Bled, uh, Gibson County, but his goal was to get to Gibson County. And he stayed there until 1848. And what happened in 1848 was that Jephthah Billingsley sent Emmanuel and his family. But at this point, he was married and had four or five children, sons, and sent them to Texas in 1848. But Shadrach Madison then shows up in the 1850 census 
in Illinois. And so either Shadrach didn't know what had happened to Emmanuel and his family, or he decided that he wasn't going to uproot his family to move into yet another slave state and chose to take them into a free state. I think as you showed here, it's hard to piece all these uh, together when the records are incomplete. Sorry, you were going to say something else? Well, I was just going to mention the name Madison. So Emmanuel always knew he was a Madison. Hmm. And so when he could have, when he was freed and could officially choose a name, he chose Madison. Many slaves would choose their owner's name, especially if, if they were pretty happy with how the owner had treated them. So he, he didn't choose the name Billingsley. He chose the name Madison. Likewise, Samuel had been owned by a Billingsley, but when he was freed, he also chose the name Madison. So it's, you know, it's the name that is really a, a, an interesting tool. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. What were things like for Jim, or we'll call him Shadrach for simplicity, since that's where he is on different records. According to your family history, did he know that James Madison was his father, and how did that affect him? Well, he did know. He certainly knew by the time he was a teenager. So according to the oral history, you know, as I said, Corrine and James Madison Jr. had a son, call him Jim. At around the same time that he was born, Dolly's had nieces come to live with them. And one of them was around the same age as Jim. They were both babies. And Corrine was assigned to be the wet nurse for, uh, her name was Victoria. And Corrine nursed both babies at the same time, which I, I understand was fairly common practice for uh, a, a slave woman who was nursing her own baby to also be assigned to nurse another baby. And so sometimes they would end up nursing at the same time, you know, a white baby on one breast and a black baby on another breast. But these two grew up to be quite good friends. And Victoria would uh, bring him to her lessons and it was illegal for slaves to learn to read, but Victoria would teach him and Madison didn't do anything to stop that. And so it's believed that he allowed that to happen because he knew that Jim was his son. And I, I believe that Jim knew that he had this privilege because of his relationship to Madison. But eventually, as they grew older, Dolly Madison decided that Jim and Victoria should be separated. But it didn't work for a while. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a, a long story. But when they became teenagers, when Victoria and Jim became teenagers, Dolly s sold Jim. And as he was being taken away, Corrine begged Jim, always remember you're a Madison. And she said that because she believed that the name could help them find each other again someday. So he certainly knew for sure at that point. And that statement, always remember you're a Madison, was the beginning of my family's credo. So as the credo, the credo began as a tool, is the name, you know, as I said, could help them find each other again someday. 
But after emancipation, my great great grandfather Emmanuel, whom we've been talking about, added something onto those words because they didn't have to use it anymore to find each other if they should be sold apart. But for him, it became an inspiration. So if your grandfather was a, a, a great man, you could be a great man too. And so he added to the credo, always remember you're a Madison. You come from a president. Hmm. Well, I'm very interested in the some of the memorabilia and documents that were passed down through your family and that you had access to as well. Because from what I studied of emancipation and the periods afterward, African-American families that were broken apart because of slavery, because this or that person was sold off for decades after emancipation would try to look for each other. And you have classified ads in newspapers up till I think World War One, where people are still looking for each other uh, because they haven't found one another. So that some of the challenges of piecing together this period in history is what you mentioned. But what are some of the uh, documents that your family did hold on to? Well, let me see. Probably the, the most exciting document is an 1834 bill of sale in which um, Emmanuel obtains a wife. He was owned by Jephthah Billingsley, but Jephthah decided that he needed to purchase a wife for, for Emmanuel. And so from Augustus King, he purchased Elizabeth. And it's a very interesting document because it kind it was a, quite a surprise to me that it says that so Augustus King says in this document to um, Jephthah, you have to provide Betsy and her issue, as they called her offspring, with you know good clothing, adequate food, and that you also have a choice as to whether or not you're going to stay together. So what's so exciting about that document is that it's actually a marriage license because they did chose to stay together. And so I believe that that's the closest thing, the the closest type of document that any African American could find about their enslaved ancestors being united legally. It would never be called a marriage license, but it was the bill of sale that put these two people together who chose then to stay together. So we we have that. We have land deeds. My so one of Emmanuel's sons was Mac and Mac was my great great grandfather. And he stayed with his owner after emancipation until he could, as a sharecropper, gather up enough money to purchase his own land. So we have the the document of the land that he purchased in, um, let me think, 1868, I believe. Yeah. He purchased... His first, uh, he purchased uh, 200 acres. So we have that land deed. And then just two years later, he sold that land and bought a larger piece of land. He bought 400 acres for $200. So we have um, the 1860 slave census. That's in there. We have birth certificates, death certificates, some personal letters, just photographs in the later years. The oldest photograph is actually my famous, my favorite photograph. It's of Elizabeth, that enslaved woman who was purchased for Emmanuel. Um, picture of her taken probably at the turn of the of the century 